we have one of our key operating principles or beliefs that software is eating the world. And this is sort of the concept that everything you have now uh, that used to exist only in the hardware-based world is now running with some kind of software. So you probably have a refrigerator that, that's got some kind of Linux microkernel in it, or perhaps a Samsung television that's got a microphone and a Linux microkernel in it. Uh, but basically, all the things that used to be just dumb objects now have some kind of, of code in them. And so as a firm, we're very much looking forward towards that process of software eating the world and dealing with some of the issues that kind of emerge as that process goes on. Uh, I was, I've been a CISO and in the security business now for about a little over 20 years. And so you know, it's, it's been interesting to watch the challenges change over time. And there have been a couple of trends that have been driving a lot of the challenges for security professionals, especially on the, the blue defense side, um, that have been really problematic. And, and one of the things that's been a pretty substantial challenge is actually the security industry itself. Right? So for a long time now, the security industry has existed as kind of an anathema to actually making things more secure. And this has been incredibly problematic with a lot of the things that have happened in terms of the way that the industry has developed. If you take a corollary to kind of the real world, imagine for a second you were just bought a brand new Toyota Corolla, you're at the dealership, you know, you've, you've signed the papers, you're driving it off the lot, and you get stopped by the salesperson who tells you you need to pay an extra 10% uh, to make sure that the car doesn't go up in flames. And that, in a nutshell, uh, is what the information security industry has become over the last couple years. Uh, and so the premise of that industry is flawed. You have a lot of people operating with a misalignment of incentives. So there are cottage industries within the security industry that actually benefit when they break your security model. There's an entire m culture of, of hackers out there um, who go out there to try to find ways to break your products, to break your, your, your organizations, or to steal your data and then turn that into a revenue generation opportunity. Um, there's a lot of these sorts of things that have developed in the security world that have been a real, really problematic for a lot of the folks. Additionally, a lot of the products that have built the cornerstone of the security industry are software products that are used to secure other products. Right? So it's layering on software security on top of a product that's fundamentally insecure from the beginning, uh, and then always buying the next generation of that bell and whistle that you pop on. But generally speaking, I think things are changing for the better. There are two very large trends that are driving a lot of the changes within technology that are actually making a tremendous amount of improvement. And I think that we're starting to see the fruits of some of those efforts being born. And so some of the things that are happening in that space is a lot of our devices now are coming with security built in. If you look at what Apple has done with their iOS devices, the fact that it is a walled garden to some extent, they've built a lot of security capabilities into those devices. They're coming you know, with, a, with a lot of capabilities that previously wouldn't be in most operating systems. And if you look at what Google has done with their Chromebook, you can see that these macro trends are kind of driving the security industry in, a, in an interesting way. Another thing that's happened uh, relatively recently is that the adversaries have become a different kind of challenge. Uh, and so one of the things that we've noticed, so obviously we have an A16Z crypto fund. We are very involved in blockchain type technologies. And so one of the things that we've noticed is that the e-crime syndicates have really moved on to using a lot of these cryptocurrency type applications. Uh, some of the breaches we've been seeing, not just at, at partners and companies that we work with, but across the industry, are where attackers are getting access to large cloud platforms and then using the access in those cloud platforms to mine cryptocurrencies. There's one company that I heard of that checked their credentials for AWS into their GitHub repo on accident, mistake that people make. Within a couple of hours, they had run up about $500,000 of AWS compute charges as people tried to mine Bitcoin. Uh, and so these are the kinds of threats and challenges that are, that are happening. Indeed, when you look at the birth of the entire ransomware market, that's pretty clearly something that's been enabled by the cryptocurrency and that sort of economy that's sprung up. Ransomware is another thing that's been changing pretty, pretty dramatically and driving a tremendous amount of churn. Um, on the ransomware space, I think the, one of the interesting things that I've noticed over the last couple of years, we've yet to see a variant of ransomware that modifies your data in the cloud, right? So cloud-aware ransomware, uh, it's something that we've heard is being developed. It's something that we've seen sort of very early indications on, and we think that that's ultimately where that ransomware space is going to go. Additionally, now you're starting to see targeted ransomware attacks, so ransomware custom designed for the victims that they're infecting, uh, and then a, a whole payment system and scheme behind that. And then the next area where things have become a challenge is just basic cloud configuration. 
Most of you probably saw the story earlier this week. There was a hosting provider that had a breach of their data uh, that was caused by, a, an, it was actually an AWS salesperson, had misconfigured the permissions on their S3 bucket and had a bunch of customer confidential in the data inside this bucket, which then got downloaded. And this was an Amazon employee. So as you can imagine, if Amazon is having difficulty in managing their own cloud systems, you're going to have difficulty in managing your own cloud systems. And so cloud config is, is something that's become a very real problem and a very real issue that has to be dealt with. Uh, and then change control in that environment is also becoming a challenge. And so at a macro level, um, the state of security generally is that, that everything is fine, and, uh, but it's actually on fire. Um, there's a couple weird things that have happened broadly uh, from a VC perspective across the, the investment. Last year, there was about $7.6 billion invested by venture capital firms into cybersecurity alone. Uh, this year, it looks like it's probably going to be substantially more because you do have a couple of very large funds that are making some pretty tremendous investments in some very large companies. Uh, hiring security talent continues to be the number one challenge that CISOs identify as struggling with. In the Bay Area, it can take upwards of six months to find a junior level security engineer. Most CISO searches now are taking well over a year, so this can be incredibly difficult to accomplish. And then if you look at some of the data that's coming out of the vendors, you, you constantly hear that security breaches are increasing. So there's always more and more data that's being leached out. There's always more and more, more bad stuff that's happening. Um, but actually, I, I, I generally like to take point with that issue because I've been doing this for quite a while. Um, if you actually look at the data uh, and you go to the Verizon breach data, which is usually the basis for a lot of these claims, you see that phishing and pretexting are about 93% of those breaches. Right? So this is nothing that's rocket science. This is not zero-day exploits. This is not a sophisticated nation state. This is your employees and your coworkers giving away their usernames and passwords. Of that 83% of all breaches, 80% of them involve people just giving away their username and password. Indeed, in San Francisco, about a year and a half ago, a bunch of security researchers did a, a study with $5 Starbucks gift certificates, handing them out in front of a number of different offices, getting people to tone over their usernames and passwords and log them into a device for that gift certificate. Right? So in reality, while breaches are, are, are off the charts and you hear a lot of data, about how breaches are getting worse and worse each year, always keep in mind that 93% of those breaches are caused by something as silly as a spear phishing email. If you look at the root cause of breaches, and this is really interesting, if you dig into the Verizon data, the Veris data, uh, you see phishing and pretexting obviously is, is number one, which is a pretty obvious problem. You see lack of security patching is, is number two. And these are not patches that are new that you didn't apply in the last five days. These are patches that have been out for over like 60 to 70 days. Right? So this is people not applying and exercising good hygiene and control of their environment, not people taking advantage of newly released vulnerabilities. And then the next root cause of breach you see is change management. People removing firewall configurations, people making changes to their production environment, people checking credentials into public repos. These are all issues that are causing security breaches. Right? You don't see sophisticated advanced nation state malware. You don't necessarily see APT in anywhere of the top uh, causes of breaches. And indeed, when you look at a lot of the sophisticated nation state campaigns, most of them be begin with some kind of theft of email credentials. Right? So it always comes back to kind of why would you pick the lock when the window is left open? Right? And so from a spend perspective, the security industry hasn't done a great job when you look at what we spend all of our money on in addressing the actual root causes of the breaches. The number one categorization for where we spend our money is authentication and authorization. So these are identity management systems. Makes sense. You could think that that would probably address some of the issues with passwords. But number two, and not by very much, is malware detection. Right? The malware detection market is huge. There's a tremendous amount of money that's being spent both on host malware detection and network-based malware detection. And finally, endpoint security and antivirus solutions. Right? None of these really map to patch management. None of these really match to change management. None of these really map to making sure that the authentication experience for your users is secure. So if you talk to a CISO, um, what you always hear is that everything sucks. Uh, I, I go to a lot of CISO events. I'm actually getting on a plane after, literally after this talk to go back west to host a CISO council meeting in, the, in, in our office tomorrow morning. Um, it usually degrades into everything sucks and my life is hell. Um, <laughs> When you talk to the CISOs, the, the really interesting things you, you hear from them, and this is more kind of from a meta perspective, uh, is that every single security technology wave has been next generation. So take a product and put next generation in front of it, and that is the product you are buying this budget cycle. Uh, they're incredibly frustrated with that. It's not actually resolving a lot of their issues. 
Most products that they build are built to solve problems with other products. Right? You have to go buy some specific type of firewall to protect devices that you can't patch in real time, that you can't have on the internet, that you can't move to the cloud. Uh, satisfaction, generally speaking, with security tools is incredibly low. Right? Like ask a CISO about the tools that they're using, ask them if they're happy with any of them. They generally are not particularly uh, fond of what's happening. But mobile and cloud, and this is kind of what's making things start to suck less, are changing a lot of things. So when you talk to some of the more forward-leaning CISOs in large organizations, they're rolling out hundreds or thousands of Chromebooks, right? They don't need to run antivirus on those endpoints. The management of those devices is much simpler, right? They're rolling out iOS devices with BYOD solutions that are part of their cloud services. They're getting their servers off of their premises and up into the cloud. And they're actually starting to resolve a lot of these issues from a design and build perspective. Finally, the other thing that you'll hear is that security skill shortage is the driving force of what most CISOs do. So you'll, you'll talk to them, you'll try to get them to look at new technology, to consider new alternatives, and they just don't have the, the bodies to do it, right? They'd love to take a look at this next generation thing, but they just can't spare the cycles. And so generally what's happened within the CISO community is that there's been a lot of folks kind of watching what other people are doing and then sort of riffing on that and implementing it in their own environment. And so that's why these CISO communities have become so important for sharing this information. And so from a five-year view perspective, kind of where do we see things heading? Uh, I think you can kind of see the emergence of a lot of this now. And, and the blockchain part isn't a joke. I'll get to that in a second. Um, the the standards-based compliance is, is driving a tremendous amount of change, right? So you look at the NIST 853 standard and the FedRAMP process that the US government has driven. That has made cloud service providers internalize security in a way that they never had before. Right? And it's forcing them, and through those relationships, to become much more open and transparent about how they operate their environments. And from that perspective, it's helped lift the whole ecosystem up. Right? And what we think and what we kind of believe is that that standards-based approach to compliance is going to continue to develop. We will continue to add more measurable, meaningful standards and have a better certification process for how those things are managed. If you are a PCI-certified vendor or doing any kind of PCI-certified work, and you've gone through an audit since the Equifax breach, you know that your PCI auditors are taking things a lot more seriously now, right? They're actually looking at scan results, they're getting really deep into your infrastructure, and they're trying to make PCI into something that means something as opposed to what it used to be a compliance exercise. Uh, cyber insurance is gonna at some point become a very real thing. Uh, at the point that you have the ability to define and categorize all the potential vulnerabilities in your infrastructure, you have the ability to implement a risk management system to, to, to calculate the risk that you can't therefore manage, you then have the ability to transfer it over to an insurer. Right? And that's something we're seeing with the cloud service providers. The fact that Amazon holds your data, the fact that Google holds your data, Box, Dropbox, means that they have liability for that information. And that's changing the way that liability discussions and cyber insurance happen. We'll also start to see some standardization on the terms for cyber insurance. One of the really interesting things that happens to most companies after they've had a breach and do have a cyber policy is that they realize that nation state attackers void the policy. Right? There's a lot of gotchas in the way that those policies are written. And I think as we start to talk about them and collaborate on them, we can share some of that information. And then finally, blockchain. Uh, this is an interesting area. Uh, there's a lot of energy around it right now. This is more interesting from my perspective and from a security perspective, less in the idea of using tokens as a form of stored value. I'm not necessarily, the, the cryptocurrency thing is interesting, but it's not particularly interesting from a security perspective. The blockchain technology enables you the ability to build communities of interest that can work together. And in working together and contributing to this centralized network are therefore compensated for their engagement. Right? It's a little bit of a different model for how you can build an organization. And if you start to think about things like ISACs, or you think about things like intelligence sharing communities, or you think about you know, other sorts of, of activities where people communicate and com commit to a community, you can start to see how blockchain and that model would drive people to start making changes. Right? One of the biggest issues that CISOs have in doing threat intelligence sharing is that they always feel like they're giving more than they're getting back. Well, what if there was a system in place that you got more the more you gave in, and it built in compensation for folks that were doing that? It also provided some form of vetting. Right? So I think there's going to be some new twists from a technology perspective put on some of the processes that we have that drive it forward. And then finally, 10 years out, um, I think where we're going to end up is that it's going to be all cloud all the time. I think this is, this is becoming relatively obvious. I think from a 10-year perspective, most folks are figuring out that they're 
data center presence will be some form of secrets management infrastructure, and then everything else will be running somewhere else. Uh, Purpose-built devices are going to really change the way we operate. Again, the iOS model, the Chromebook model, this belief that we can build security in kind of obviates the need for a lot of the previous bolt-on security that we've seen. Uh, and then finally, the, the Beyond Corp and, and Zero Trust movements. So this is something that's been kicking around for a while now. Zero Trust was a, a concept that was floated by, I think it was a Forrester researcher sometime in the early 2000s. The idea is that you, we need to go through your environment and eliminate any implicit trust relationships. So the way that we traditionally built corporate networks and production infrastructure was that if you were on the corporate network, you could get access to the production network. Right? So I would come into my office, I would put my laptop on the LAN, and I could then connect to production. That is a transit of trust relationship. And the zero trust model would say that you start to eliminate that. And you start to put barriers in place of accessing these things. And you operate from a premise that nothing has trust inside of these environments. Uh, Beyond Corp is Google's kind of spin on that, where they've started to implement new technologies and solutions for doing transient kind of VPN type access technologies so that the idea of a corporate network kind of disappears, right? And when you show up at work, you're basically just working from a, a Starbucks network that's sitting there uh, on the internet. And so these are the things that we think are going to start to drive a lot of the investment and in technology themes. And so thank you very much. I really do uh, appreciate your patience. And with that, I'll, I'll start to invite our federal panelists on to the stage. If we can go to a slide. Oh, thank you.